uh, well, for, for the time being, is quite uh, different. It's all about uh, uh, diagnostics and how to make sense of what we have in the blood. So in this case, the work is mainly uh, all because I have Philippe in the lab. He's a great bioinformatician, which are very, uh, very keen on uh, diagnostics. So um, usually the best way to analyze a tumor, to characterize a tumor, is just to get a bite, get the DNA, uh, sequence it, or analyze the cells in the tumor by immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry, say so we could have. Of course, the problem is that uh, a biopsy is something somehow invasive. It's something you cannot really uh, repeat more than once. So it's just a few decades that people started thinking, maybe we can characterize tumor, not from the, directly from the tumor tissue, but from what there is in the bloodstream. So, of course, in the bloodstream there are all the cells, which at this point we don't, don't care, but what we care is all the DNA that is released in the, in the bloodstream by dying cells. So, of course, usually it's healthy tissue that releases DNA. Most of it, of course, are, are the cells from the from blood, so lymphocytes, the macrophages, neutrophils, and so on. But in case of tumors, of course, a tumor will uh, will grow, will uh, divide very fast, will die very fast, and will release plenty of DNA in the blood cell. The main problem, actually, there are several problems here, is that. Of course, tumor is only a fraction of all the DNA present in the blood cell, the, of all cell, cell the DNA. The other problems are that this DNA comes from dying cells. So one is very highly fragmented. Basically, it's uh, we only get nucleosomes or denucleosomes or three nucleosomes, so 160 base pairs, 320 for 18. And then, of course, being a, um, a product of dying cells, it's cleared very fast from the blood. So the concentration is very low. So just to give you an example, from a 10 ml uh, vial of blood, we usually get between 50 and 200 nanograms of really crap. So the idea for liquid biopsy is actually to use it across all the, all the uh, care of the patient, depending, of course, on what you can see. So from early detection to uh, prognostic analysis to search for uh, uh, remaining tumor or relapse. So usually since the DNA is so low and so poor, the usual approach, so most of the companies will create all sort of kits where you just uh, go and look for what you know. So you just amplify the DNA and look for specific mutation in one gene, in several genes, panel of genes. The, the largest kit I, I'm aware of is just a sequence about 7,000 gene fragments to, to, have, uh, to characterize the tumor. And of course, you can also get a, a very good uh, sensitivity. A paper from Travis Walton this year showed that you, you can go down to 0.01% of tumor DNA using amplifying the DNA. Our approach, though, is a bit different. So we start from nano for sequencing. So uh, I assume uh, you know, so nanopore sequencing works because you have a membrane with several nanopores and uh, you just bring the native DNA to the nanopore uh, using an helicase that will bind to the nanopore. The helicase will just unwrap the DNA and will 
the same one of the two uh, strands inside the, the power. The passing of the DNA, since the DNA is a charged uh, uh, compound, will also change the current in the power. And based on the changes in the current, we can extrapolate the sequence of the DNA. <laughs> so the, the ups of, na of nanopore sequencing is that uh, we sequence the native DNA, what is the you don't uh, you don't rely on resynthesizing uh, DNA like in Illumina, and of course you can also read very long uh, reads. So in that case, uh, yeah, the word record right now is actually it's not four point two now it's four point a single read of four point four million base pairs. In our lab is one point three, one point three eight. Uh, which, of course, you could say that for lipid biopsy doesn't really matter because our fragments are very small. The cons of uh, nanopore sequence is the error rate, which is uh, compared to Illumina, really abysmal. So, with the newer chemistry, you reach 99.4% accuracy, which is quite far from the 99.99% of Illumina. And the throughput is not as good as, uh, as Illumina yet. But you can do several things here. So with cell-free DNA, of course, you don't have much. So if you don't want to amplify the DNA, you have to rely on what you sequence. So really, the throughput is not really a problem. So usually, we sequence between 3 and 15 million reads per samples. And then we just look at the density of the read. So we map the, these reads and we just look at the, at the density and what, not very colored. <laughs> so imagine that every, every different color, even the invisible ones are different chromosomes. So, and uh, the shades you see just indicate the fluctuation in density of reads, but the average basically is a line because it, in, for healthy donors, you just get the deployed amount of DNA. If we go then and we look at what happens with uh, lung cancer, in this case, a patient with lung cancer, you start seeing that thing change. And so for, you can see, for example, here a deletion of uh, chromosome 2, an amplification of, of the long arm of chromosome one. So you can start seeing, so in this case, these are a few patients. You can find everything that is already known to be present usually in lung cancer. So gains or loss of, of, uh, of genetic pieces, copy number alterations. The other thing you can get, so here, is uh, using uh, uh, a few, there are several algorithms to try to extrapolate from the economic profile of the tumor, the percentage of, DNA, of tumor DNA in the cell-free DNA. So in this case, this is about 40%. We can go down to 5%, not less than that. But 5% is not really something we can analyze properly. For proper analysis, we need 10%. The other thing you can get is how, how heterogeneous is the tumor. Because, you can, of course, you can see clonal amplification, but you can also see subclonal uh, amplification or deletions. Then, you have something else. So we sequence native DNA. Native DNA meaning that if I have a cytosine and a methyl cytosine, and they behave differently. So as when I sequence the with nanopore, at the same I get both the sequencing and the methylation pattern in each read. So and so at that time this is something we did a few hours uh, a few years ago. Now there are much better uh, tools to analyze the uh, the methylation. And for example, what 
we can see. So what? Uh, so these are data from uh, TCGA. So in in lung cancer, you can see there are patterns. So these are partially demethylated domains, and you can still see them when we analyze the plasma from, uh, from a patient with lung cancer, while we don't see them in healthy plasma. How can we use them? So, for example, we can look at the overall methylation levels in the, in the cell-free DNA. And of course, in tumor, usually you have an hypomethylation. Even better, you can cross together. So if I have a, a copy number alteration, a, a copy number gain, there there is an enrichment of tumor DNA. So if I just look at gains, diploid, and losses, I can see that when we look at the gains, at chromosomal gains, we have uh, even more, more decrease in DNA methylation. And this is just, okay, this is a number. We can see there is a difference. But this cooler though is that if we start from methylation uh, atlases. So we have a methylation atlas um, from uh, uh, Moss et al. To, to 2018 is a, a reference atlas from, uh, from 25 different tissues. So I, here I have the pattern for every, well, for 400. So this atlas is uh, based on the 450k platform from Illumina. And so we have 450 information on 450,000 CPG sites. So I can use this to train, uh, um, to make an analysis of a deconvolution of what we have in the plasma. So if we do that, so in LT cells, you see most of the compound, most of the DNA originates from blood cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, megalocytes, granulocytes. When we go to the tumor, you start seeing this increase in the epithelial component. So since this is just to show you easily what can be seen, but we can go deeper. So if we take the methylation, so in this case, I, I have also the methylation pattern for pneumocytes with 2,000 sites, more or less, that I can use. I can use those sites to, to understand what is the percentage of DNA originating from the from lung cells, of course, tumor. If you see here, so here is the tumor fraction estimated from copy number variation. This is the tumor fraction estimated using the methylation pattern. You see, basically, it's quite uh, correlates quite well. The same is if instead of using lung, uh, the lung methylation pattern, we use the patterns from lung cancers. In this case, of course, we have far larger side and you have a much better correlation between the tumor fractions. Another thing we can do though, I mean, in that case, there is a very clear uh, possibility to use in diagnostic, uh, di for diagnostic uses, here a bit less. So in this case, we have NKX2, which is a transcription factor, which is only specific for lung cells. So if we look at the, if we just take all the transcription, transcription factor binding sites and we pile them together, of course, with the LT, we don't see much. But in the tumor samples, we start seeing a dip because, of course, in this case, the transcription factor will be able to bind there because it's not methylated. And then there is the fragmentomics. So for 
reason we really don't know. It has been shown that uh, uh, cancers have a, a shorter, so uh, mm, it's actually a discontinuative. So in short, cancer, cancer samples have shorter fragments. Probably this is due to endonucleases acting during the uh, cell death. We, it's still not clear, but you can easily see here. So blue is uh, LT pay, LT donors, brown is cancers. So you see here this shoulder here in this area, an increase, a decrease in the size. And on the dinucleotar zones is even better. You really see two different things. And of course, well, of course, it's stressed here. The other thing you can look at is the pattern, how these fragments are and the ends of the, of the fragments, because this, this depends on the nucleases. Again, somebody has shown that there is a difference between tumors and, and healthy. And uh, here, what we see with the nanopore, again, no, these are the, the most different ones, but actually the strongest one is the tetranucleosal CCCA, where you see that in tumors you start seeing less of that uh, tetranucleosal at the end. And of course, you can start mixing and ma matching. So, for example, if I take only the fragments that are smaller and I reanalyze the, the I, remain, I do again genomic profile, I can increase the tumor fraction artificially. So I can start seeing things that were not really visible at the beginning. So here there is a, a, a here I see some chromosomal gains that in the original sample before before enrichment were not being present. So this way, for example, if we start following up tumors. We, we might see, start seeing dynamic changes and, uh, and it might be useful. So yeah, this is where we are. And uh, basically we're shown that we can use a nanopore sequencing for all genome sequencing from cell 3 DNA, which, which actually nobody really believed it was possible. And the beauty of it, is that uh, it's very uh, cost uh, efficient, very user friendly user of nanopore. It's real time because you can uh, um, you can call the bases while you read. So as soon as you get the six million reads we need for the analysis, we can stop the the sequencing and go on with the next one. And what we are looking back back forward now is to start uh, applying it to the clinics. So the idea, of course, in this case is what happens if we take a blood sample before treatment and we correlate with what happens later on in the evolution of the disease. And again, here, Filippo is here. But would I also participate? And Catherine is the one continuing here. Um, that's all. <laughs> oh, no, wait. And there are many collaborators, both from Florence, Alberto Maggi, Jacopo Petrini, and from uh, Israel, the one who collaborated with of the methylation analysis. And that's all, folks. <laughs>